on the Bronze Age Russian steppe in the depths of winter in 1800 BC. A group of 12 adolescent boys traveled from their home village to a sacred site. Here they conducted the most important ritual of their lives. Each boy brought with him the dog that he had raised from a puppy. And then, during this ritual, he would kill his beloved dog and cook and consume part of its flesh. This ritual was not only carried out on the Bronze Age steppe. Similar rites were practiced from the Atlantic coasts of Europe all the way to the Ganges in India for thousands of years. The acts themselves and the meanings behind them changing in descendant populations over the millennia. But why did they do this? What was its purpose? And what does it have to do with the warriors of Sparta and the founding of ancient Rome? This is the story of the midwinter dog sacrifice. Rites of passage are profoundly important events in societies around the world and throughout history. These rites are about moving from one state of being to another. We have rites, ceremonies and cultural traditions marking birth and death, marriage and academic success and so on throughout our lives. For the ancient Indo-European cultures of Eurasia, the journey from childhood to adulthood was a long one, marked by many stages. In reconstructing this process, we must bear in mind that there were many variations of this tradition expressed by societies from the Neolithic into historical times. But let us imagine a Bronze Age village in Eastern Europe. This was a highly patriarchal, hierarchical society, and these traditions were meant primarily for the elites. Perhaps 20 or 25% of the population formed this elite class, and it was the men of that class who owned the property, in the form of land, cattle and people. The remainder of the population were herders and farmers and craftsmen, and there were slaves at the bottom of the social hierarchy. The elite men were concerned with warfare in whatever form it took in their culture, for example, raiding for slaves, women and cattle, as well as defending their village and their people from the raids of others. These activities were important because success in them meant that their people would thrive and failure meant that they would weaken, suffer and perhaps even be destroyed. These men had to know who they could trust and successful villages, clans and tribes were held together by complex kin networks. A man would know that because they shared an honorable great-grandfather, he could call on his third cousin two villages away to help with a blood feud or an important raid. Lineage was vitally important, but there were other bonds. Guest friendships and sacred oaths could bind men together, and these bonds could also extend through generations. This is seen in the Iliad, when Diomedes and Glaucus meet on the battlefield and discover that their fathers had been guest friends. Instead of fighting, they exchange armor and so reinforce the sacred relationship that they had inherited. So to be a man in these societies meant being able to raid and fight. It meant the ability to trust your kinsmen with your life and to earn their trust in turn. It meant knowing the ancient law of your people and honoring the laws inherited from your forefathers. The gods, great and small, had to be understood and honored in the proper ways. Only by living rightly would you and your people prosper. We call these societies patriarchal and hierarchical, but we must understand that in practice, this meant that collectively the elite men of the clan were the clan. If by some tragedy all their slaves and herders were lost, if all their wives and children were killed or taken, the clan would continue in the warriors themselves. If they were strong enough, they could always take more women and cattle, and their way of life, their traditions and lineages would continue. But if the elite men were killed or taken as slaves, then all would be lost. 
And likewise, if their traditions were not rigidly imposed, generation after generation, then the effect would be the same. And so, in the long transition from boyhood to manhood, the rites of passage were meant to instill the knowledge, skills and virtues necessary to perpetuate their people. These boys would become the custodians of tradition, and nothing was more important than this. So what would this process involve then? Well, a young boy might spend his early years around his mother and the other women and children, playing, learning and helping with household tasks. The ages vary, but around the age of seven, he would undergo his first rite in the transition from childhood to adulthood, being physically removed from the domestic setting to learn the practices of his father and uncles and other kinsmen. Perhaps he would begin to learn tracking, hunting and trapping. Perhaps he would accompany his father on trading journeys to other villages. His martial training might begin, learning first of all how to carry and maintain the weapons of the warriors. And he would spend time in the company of older boys and men, hearing tales of heroism, cunning and battle, in the form of boasting, song and poetry. As a child, he would have seen his mother and the other women making offerings to the goddesses of the hearth, the home and the womb. But now he was amongst the men. He would learn about other gods and the proper ways to appease them. There were many stages throughout this time as the boy grew and reached puberty. But eventually, when the boy was about 14 to 18 years old, he would be ready for the final break with childhood. The boy would have to die so that the man could be born. But between these two states, he would be transformed into a wild animal. At the appropriate time of year, usually midwinter, a group of boys would leave the village, the homestead or the mobile camp that was their normal domestic setting and travel to a special place to conduct the ritual. A special valley or grove of trees, the mouth of a cave or simply a ritual circle marked out on the endless grasslands. Proceedings would be led by the appropriate adult men. Perhaps it would be the chief and his men in some cultures, or the priests in others, or experienced warriors, or ritual specialists whose role it was to lead and guide these rites. How many boys would take part in the rite would depend on the size of the clan or tribe, but there were also special sacred numbers, especially multiples of three, most commonly 9 and 12. The rites may have lasted for one day or multiple days. The boys would have demonstrated their physical strength and endurance through ecstatic weapon dances and demonstrated their knowledge and wisdom through performing songs or reciting poetry or recalling the famous names and heroic deeds of their mighty ancestors. They may have consumed sacred, mind-altering substances like mead or fermented mare's milk, later on perhaps beer or wine, possibly cannabis, psilocybin mushrooms, poppy seeds, ephedra or some special combinations of these. Prolonged ritual dancing, drumming and chanting might have helped create altered mental states, again separating the participants from the ordinary world. By this time, it is likely they had been stripped of their belongings and their clothing. Their skin was painted white with chalk or black with charcoal, masking their ordinary human form. And then we come to the moment of transformation. The participants would be symbolically transformed from their juvenile human state into an animal. One wolf or dog, or perhaps many of them, would be slaughtered and the animal would be butchered, cooked and consumed by the youths. Breaking the taboo of eating an animal that was not normally consumed was another inversion of the normal way of life. And through consuming the flesh in this ritualistic manner, they would take on the attributes of these animals. They became wild beasts, 
no longer subject to the laws of men, no longer bound to the laws of their people. They would swear their sacred oaths to the leader of their band and to the only God that now ruled over them, the God of the war band. In the Proto-Indo-European language of the late Neolithic steppes, these war bands were called the Kurios. The boys would now be clothed with a wolf skin or a dog skin, the animal's head covering their own like a hood, and the rest of it covering their shoulders and back if it was large enough. The skin was bound to them by a belt, the symbol of their binding oath. Finally, these young wolves, this pack of dogs, would leave the sacred ritual space and together they would enter the wilderness. They were part of the village, their clan, no longer. They were now a war band, raiders, killers and thieves. They could not return, could not speak to their people and could receive no food or help. They had to steal, raid and kill to survive until it was time to return. This period of expulsion may have lasted for six months and the rites of return and reincorporation may have taken place in midsummer. Although for some cultures, this period might have extended for years. At the appointed time, the ritual for reincorporation back into the tribe, this time as men, involved being submerged in water in some cultures and the burning of their tattered wolf skins in others. They could now fully participate in their society as men. They would become warriors, own property, get married and father children. And so these rites would continue down the generations. This ritual then was central to their way of life because it helped to forge the men required to preserve it. But how do we know all of this? These secretive practices were carried out largely by illiterate people who wrote none of this down. And yet there are clues to be found in the mythology, cultural practices and languages of later descendant cultures. A familiar historical example emerging from the Koryosh tradition is the Spartan institution of the Agoge, the rigorous process by which aristocratic boys from the age of seven learned to become Spartan warriors. And it is recorded that young Spartan males sacrificed a dog or dogs to Anyalios, an archaic god of war mentioned in the Iliad and in a Mycenaean Linear B tablet, as they entered the age group of Aphibos at around 17 years old. However, details of the ceremony are not preserved. And then there is the Roman ritual known as Lupercalia, the Wolf Festival. This was described by Cicero as the oldest Roman ritual, inherited from an ancient period before civilization. Lupercalia was dedicated to the god Faunus, a deity of cattle and shepherds in the wild, uncultured places beyond the settled social space. In this rite, a dog and a goat were sacrificed and their blood was wiped on the foreheads of adolescent boys. They consumed a feast and then ran naked around the base of the Palatine Hill, following the ancient border of the city, the liminal space between law and wildness. And of course, this was bound up with the founding myth of Rome itself. The Lupercal Cave, where the run began, was where Romulus and Remus were suckled by a she-wolf after being conceived by the god Mars and cast out into the wild by their elite family. When grown, these brothers recruited landless, unmarried, wandering young males to become Rome's first citizens. And they procured wives for themselves by taking them in a raid from the Sabine tribe. It is no coincidence that so many founding heroes of Indo-European cultures are associated with wolves and dogs. And several Germanic clan names are formed on the base of the words wolf and dog. Countless settlements and lineages across Eurasia were begun by these youthful warrior bands while they were clad in wolf and dogskin cloaks, transformed into these animals at their initiation rite. But although there is an abundance of historical and linguistic evidence 
from Irish, Germanic, Italian, Greek, Iranian and Indian cultures, these kinds of momentary rites, carried out in special places away from settlements, are practically impossible to find archaeologically. However, there is one site in Russia that provides hard evidence to support the conclusions of the folklorists, mythologists, historians and linguists about the midwinter dog sacrifice. The Shrobnaya culture, also called the Timber Grave culture, is a Bronze Age archaeological culture of Eastern Europe, occupying the steppes north of the Black Sea and the Caspian, between about 1900 BC and 1450 BC. This is very roughly contemporary with the early Mycenaean period in Greece. And there is one Shrobnaya settlement at krasno samarskoye which was occupied for a few decades, sometime between 1900 and 1700 BC. This settlement is not a normal Shrobnaya village. The settlement was founded beside a line of three large burial mounds that were a thousand years old by that time. The site itself clearly had ritual importance due to this proximity, and the settlement had only one household, which was not a sustainable way of life unless it was occupied by ritual specialists supported by the communities around it. And it's this site that provides archaeological evidence for the midwinter dog sacrifice in the form of the enormous number of dog bones found here. Just to be clear, dogs are not normally eaten in Indo-European cultures and there is usually a taboo against it. The dogs at this site, however, were roasted before being chopped into small pieces. These dogs were not butchered in the ordinary way that we would process an animal for food, as cattle and sheep were at this site. Instead, the dogs were hacked into small pieces. The heads were roasted and then chopped into pieces with a bronze axe in a standardized, ritualized sequence of cuts. These pieces of roasted flesh on the bone would have been distributed to the youths who ate the meat not for sustenance, but to symbolically absorb the animal's attributes. These were older dogs. 83% were 6 to 12 years old or older, and they had been treated well in life, suggesting they were familiar companions. The age range could be explained by teenage boys bringing their own dogs with them. Perhaps they raised the puppy from the time they began their journey to manhood. On the other hand, Maybe these were simply working dogs at the end of their useful lives. But between 70 and 90% of the dogs killed here were male, showing that they were carefully selected before being brought here for this exclusively male ritual. And it's thought that they were brought here from elsewhere because despite the extraordinarily large numbers of dog bones, very few of these bones had been gnawed on by dogs. There were no dogs living at this site, and so they had to have been brought here from elsewhere. Testing shows that they were killed exclusively in the cold months of the year, which aligns with many wolf and dog-related festivals in descendant cultures. There were wolf bones too, not many, but they were the most frequent wild animal here and were presumably hunted or trapped specially for these ceremonies. We know this because a wolf skull was chopped up in the same standardized ritualized pattern as the dog skulls. But most were dogs, and considering their number and the ages at the point of death, it is possible that this rite was intended to be psychologically traumatic. To kill an old, familiar dog, your own dog, raised from a puppy even, would be an emotionally significant kill. To be men in these societies meant being willing and able to kill other men, the enemies of your people. So amongst many other things, the midwinter dog sacrifice, almost certainly carried out here at Kresno Samarskoye, and right across Eurasia for thousands of years, prepared the young participants for their futures as killers of men. There is more to say about the traditions of the Indo-European Koryos warband. For one thing, there are other sites in Europe that might be related to this initiation. We must also talk about the special role of the leader of the warband and how he was chosen and the sacred time of the year set aside for the warband. 
and the nature of the god of the warband, and so on. So please subscribe to the channel if you'd like to see videos on these topics in future. Thank you to my patrons for supporting the channel. If you enjoy my videos, please consider joining us on Patreon and accessing the exclusive content there. Now, please watch this video on Berserker Warriors and their origins in the ancient Koryos tradition. Thank you for watching.